happened here. Yes, and being baptized into the <clears throat> name of the Father and the Son, oh, I already give it away. Uh, I've, I uh, became a pastor and I had to baptize and I think, yeah, the first time you need to baptize, let's study the whole thing. And then the Lord says, me, look, look up the word in. Baptize the people in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Who, who has been witness of a baptism? You know that we always do it and it's, it's like a bit awkward. Uh, give your testimony. Oh, God save me, touch me, wonderful. Okay, now we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then we think, uh, let's add in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Well, what is that? What, uh, what, in our language is when I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's like I am baptizing you and I'm doing it in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. But that's a bit how it is in our language. But you know the word in in the Greek is the word into. I baptize you into the name. Let me change that for you into the family name. I baptize you into the family name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. At the beginning of your beliefs, when you got baptized, you were baptized into the family. So here is sitting, sons and daughters. And how is it? Because if that's true, did you then become a son? And because you're a son, you're an heir? Because you're part of the family. But how can it be that we so struggle to then believe or live glorious lives because now we're royalty. You realize you're royalty and it's even of a level which is a bit beyond earthly royalty. You became part of heaven's family. <laughs> God Almighty, the glorious one, is your dad. <laughs> now we're going to look into what is it that we can still be so low not be super excited because of that fact. What is it? Um, I became a believer uh, from an unbeliever's life. I was a DJ in the Netherlands and it actually happened on a party where the beer came from the roof. So it was quite a wild party. <laughs> and I had organized it and it was like a village. They saved all year to do one big party. So I had unlimited budget. And um, I had hired striptease. Anyone know what that is? Yeah. Praise God. Keep your imagination here, man. No, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> so, and, uh, but we also had karaoke. So I, I was DJing and we had karaoke. And I hate karaoke. We did it because the people love it. And, uh, and it, uh, it, it brings more money than when you just DJ. So we had a karaoke show. And then I was smart. I thought, yeah, with all that beer... They even sing like, it's terrible, it's like... So I hired myself some singers, some girls, to fill up. So I let them do karaoke and everyone thinking everyone drunk. They don't even know or they're not from this village. So then I had good singing in between. So then I got a bit of a line which was bearable for my own ears. And one of these girls was a Christian. She was a believer, but imagine believing girls. She was brought by a friend. I... I contacted the friend. She brought her friend to sing karaoke. But then as a believer girl with beer from the roof and naked ladies running around, she was a bit... <laughs> so she was a bit grumpy. Like, where did I get into? But it was a cute girl. I'm a man. I wasn't married at that time. So uh, I'm, uh, she, she, she comes close. I said, uh, hey, you're a bit grumpy. You want to talk about it? I said, uh, can talk to me about everything, even if it's about God. And I still don't know. Yeah, I know why I said it, but I mean, I never said anything like that. Probably the Spirit pushed that through me. Can talk to me, even if it's about God. He put her hand in her side. I'm going to talk to you about God, but you're going to shut up and I'll do the talking. Because I have a relationship with him and you clearly not. <laughs> I said... I was shocked. I mean, I grew up in a village with the Dutch Reformed churches around, you know. I, 
I, I, I went with my moped on a Sunday because they walk in the street on Sunday in the Netherlands, like with black suits. And I went with my moped through them to get them angry. <laughs> so I, I think a cute girl and she has a relationship with God. I say, you stay to the end of the evening and you tell me how you do that. I want to know. She says, I'm no way going to stay till the end of the evening here. But I'll give you my phone number and then I'll explain you later in the week. And I remember thinking, well, if it's all rubbish, I still have her phone number. <laughs> that all happened. So I'm calling, I'm getting her mom. And I think, okay. So can, can I have your daughter? She says, what is it about? She said, yes, she would tell me about the relationship with God. She said, oh, I'll talk to you. Long story short, uh, a week later I was at their table, the mom prayed with me. And a couple of weeks later in their church I was sitting and I'll never forget it. It was like my life was passing by and at the same time Jesus was there. And I start crying, crying, crying. And by the way, all these sweet people who always come like with the tissue. When is the first time? Leave the guy. You know, he doesn't feel like tissues or whatever or having to be polite to... <laughs> And then I got into the Christian world and that was one big puzzle. Man, what is going on here? And after a couple of years, I was already in youth ministry. I was very frustrated. I got the believing youth excited. You know, as a DJ, I know how to throw a party. So I started like a youth, a youth uh, <coughs> meeting. And then with, I had uh, all the equipment. I had people outside spitting fire for everyone who welcomed in music, or s smoke, everything. So the youth start coming, but it was only the Christian youth. And we didn't reach the unbelievers. So I was very frustrated. So one day, through a miraculous story, there's no time for that now, I end up in Singapore in a church, which was actually in a conference center, in the middle of a shopping center, in the midst of this vibrant western city. And there were 3,000 people lined up to get into the church. And I think, what's going on here? All Asians, big Bible under their arm, through the shopping center, a big line. And four days, or four times in one day, four times, they had four services, and four times a line of 3,000 people was ready to get in. And I get inside, and it was Pastor Joseph Prince preaching. And I was sitting there, and I remember the first service. It's so impressive, I was only like, I was baffled. So I gone, got back for the fourth service again, to be again in, and I was sitting second row, bit on that empty chair there that's where I'm sitting and he's preaching and his sermon takes a complete other turn he didn't plan it at all he, he does four times same sermon he's live there but he went completely different from the first service so he did a bit on Abba father and there I was sitting being a believer crying 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 if I heard about my God I sensed him when I became a believer but here I was meeting him again for the first time, my Abba. And then after that, he went off track to the story of Lazarus, Lazarus dying. And he's preaching and he says, the, the, the Christian world, the church world has missed a key element from the story of Lazarus. He said, so it gets preached that Jesus says, Lazarus, arise. He said, and then we get sermons about how the cloths which were put on him need to be taken off. And we use that in the Christian world. Okay, someone becomes a believer, but there can still be bondage. There needs to be an unwinding of stuff from life. Amen? He said, but what we missed, and that's actually the most important part, is that there's a stone in front of the grave. And the first commission from Jesus actually says to the people, roll away the stone. He said, because if you don't roll away the stone, the resurrected life cannot come forth. If someone is called to life by Jesus, the first thing which actually needs to happen is that the stone is removed from the grave where you were in. And then the light starts coming in as the stone is moving. The light starts coming in and by the eyes, the eyes go to the light. And now the body wants to move towards the light as it increases. 
He said, and then we can take care of the bondages. He says, because otherwise we try to help people in bondage and the next week they come back. Yeah, it helped a bit last week, but it's back. And let's go uh, up, down, up, down, up, down. He said, it's because we don't roll away the stone. He says, and you know, that's actually removing the law. Because it's one thing that God gives grace, but we often mix law and grace. He said, and that's the problem in the Christian church all over the world. Doesn't matter what denomination, we end up mixing law and grace. He said, and that's actually the commission on my life. Roll away the stone. And then he got hit. And he jumps off the stage. He was standing on stage. He jumps off. And that's your commission as well, son. Roll away the stone. That's what needs to be done in Holland and in Europe and in the rest of the world. I was sitting there as a former DJ and I had only been preaching on sex before marriage. Yes or no? Does Jesus go to the discotheque? Does he leave you at the door when you go in? Or yes or no? So I was like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know it's significant, but I've never been preaching on law and grace. That was not my world. I was among the youth. But I felt that's important. So afterwards we met. He was in shock by what he did and how strong it was. So afterwards we meet and we sit down. And I'm telling him, Pastor, this message, this is what we've been missing. I've been so frustrated. We don't reach the unbeliever. And it's only for the Christians. But what, what you preach, that grace. And I, I'm going to go home and I'm going to preach it. He said, you missed it, he said. <laughs> you got it wrong. The commission wasn't go and preach grace he said because that's the commission go and preach the gospel you don't need a commission for that you don't need a prophetic word that's always there go and preach grace he said the commission of the lord was roll away the stone remove the law and i did it a bit on sunday but then you were all off guard because we use stories and we use personal testimony but what actually was happening, because by many of you experienced a certain freedom, a lightening, uh, because with the grace, at the same time, the stone was rolled away. And that's what producing light and life. And, and this morning I was under the shower and said, what I'm going to wear, I think I'm going to put your theme on. Because true move is when the law is removed from your life and you start seeing light and you will go to the light. You will move if you see the light. Amen? Amen. But it's, it's less story, it's less testimony, it's more doctrine. It's still fun, but it's going to be doctrine. So we start with a verse from John. We're going to look at John, which is the fourth gospel, and we're going to look at Matthew. And John says something where you're ready for, you know. Normally with the Jews, it really had to start with Matthew. We'll see later why. But with us, we can start in John. And John has a statement. Unbelievable. It's John 1, 18. He says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Is it there? Yes. No one has ever seen God. Wait a second, John. What are you saying? No one has ever seen God. You know, in that time, they got very angry when you say that. Because you don't realize you read your Bible. But when John says no one has ever seen God, and they already had the law for 1,500 years. Well, let, me, let, me ask, let me ask you. Can you get to know God through the law? You know, when I, when, I, when I don't introduce it like this, no one has ever seen God. I just ask a congregation wherever, in, in, in Holland, in any nation, can you get to know God through the law? 80% says yes. And the rest is, ah, this is probably a trick question, I'm not going to answer. <laughs> John made it very clear. They had the law for 1,500 years. They had the biggest part of this book and they knew it by head. They could quote it. They could make the connections. They had this, what you and I have. And he says, and yet no one has ever seen God. Oh, so you can have your Bible. You can know it from cover to cover. And you cannot know God. Whoa. 
that is quite hectic, isn't it? So then he says, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father. Other translations said, he's at the bosom of the Father. So Jesus was resting on God's heart, knew God's heart. Yeah, he said, but we see him, we see him moving around, we see him walking around, we see him do stuff. Yes, but spiritually, he was resting at the bosom of the Father, hearing his heart and doing with his hand and feet what the Father wanted. He's in closest relationship with the Father and he has made him known. Not the law, not the scriptures. Jesus has made him known. So we need Jesus even to understand the scriptures. To get, grab life from the scriptures. Oh, you're also looking so serious. <laughs> Now let's see what it says before, because this is a conclusion. John comes with a conclusion. He says all kinds of stuff. We all know John 1 starts like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was God. And then the Word became flesh, we all know. The word in other words, this, this took on a human form. And if it doesn't take on a human form, and we read it, and we draw conclusions, we don't end up with God. It took Jesus to become flesh and show us what this means. And us just reading it and us making our conclusions, we don't get to know God. We actually, if we don't watch it, we represent the devil. Ooh. Yeah, when Jesus showed up, he was the true spotless lamb. He showed up in the temple. He started speaking on behalf of God. They want to kill him. That's quite serious. When he said, God is my father, they want to kill him. Did you ever study when they wanted to kill Jesus? It's two occasions, always two occasions. Or he calls God his father, he calls himself son. So that's the, what the, gets the devil mad. Or he was breaking the Shabbat. In other words, against all the rules, he did a miracle. Helping someone against all odds. That made the devil mad. The devil thought as long as they don't heal on the Shabbat, at least I have one day that nothing is happening for that kingdom. <laughs> Now let's see what he, what the, what's the introduction to this. The word became flesh. But then he starts explaining something so important. He says, and the word became flesh dwelled among us. And we have seen his glory. So you didn't see glory in the law. We have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. Now this is quite important. So Jesus came and what did he show? We know now from that first scripture, he showed us the Father. He's the only one who can show us the Father. He's the only one through which we can know God. And the first observation of John is, we, it was glorious what we got to see. What a charismatic person Jesus was. And he was full of grace and truth. And then it goes on, then he talks a bit about how even John the Baptist witnessed of that. And then we're already again distracted because he's talking he's saying something about jesus and then it comes back he said from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace what do people receive when jesus is around grace upon grace for the law was given through moses grace and truth came through jesus christ now we're already a bit puzzled. So Jesus came and he was glorious. In other words, it was quite pleasant to be in his presence. He was glorious. And if you wanted to receive, and anyone who wanted to receive would receive, because John said, we all received, grace upon grace. But wait a second, he was full of grace and truth. Now this bottle is full of water. If you pour this bottle out, what happens? What comes out? water if this bottle would be full of grace and truth what should come out when you pour it out grace and truth what did come out next one no sorry can we go back to uh, uh, 16 and 17 john 1 16 17 
For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. So if you have Jesus full of grace and truth, what comes out is grace upon grace. And what, you know what we should conclude? If grace upon grace comes out, now we know the truth about God. So truth doesn't pertain to, oh, there's grace, there's grace, but there need to be balance. Can we also speak about truth? Then we go back to the law. Truth pertains to who is God. And you know who God is? If you get him and he comes close and you receive from him, you receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. So Jesus was full of grace and truth. The grace is for you. The truth pertains to the Father. No one has ever seen God, not through any law, not through any commandment, not through any keeping any rule. No one has ever seen him, but Jesus has shown him. And if you pour Jesus out, you get grace upon grace. What, what, what can there be wrong about grace? Or how can we be preaching too much grace? John says, when we had Jesus around, we received grace upon grace. Not new regulation upon new regulation. And then it says, for the law was given through Moses. He puts that on one side. And then you could almost say, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. We had the law for 1500 years and we didn't figure out God, not at all. We missed him when he arrived. We didn't recognize him. So for the law came through Moses, but grace for mankind and the truth about God came through Jesus Christ. And how does that play out when we put someone in the story? Because this is all doctrine, 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 doctrine. But now let's take a woman caught in adultery. How does that apply to her? How apply what we just saw to a woman caught in adultery? So now we go from John 1 to chapter 8. And there you see that the tension between Moses and Jesus, doctrinally, comes to the issue. You all know the story of the woman caught in adultery? <laughs> and you know it happens in the temple. It happens in the most religious environment you can imagine. And then it says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. And they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. So what do you say? You see? They say, Moses says, stone her. The law came through Moses. Moses says, stone a woman like that. And now we go to the other side, grace and truth. What do you say? You see the difference? You see that it's the battle between, do we apply the law to the woman? Or are we going to apply Jesus to the woman? Anyone interested? And on which side would you want to be? Funny enough, everyone ar around there was on the side of, of, of the law. Let's treat that woman according to law. And I had it a bit bold. Did it come through? Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. No. <clears throat> Read with me. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And then it comes. And placing her in the midst law and legalistic people and religion will place you in the midst so Jesus knowing he was in the most religious environment possible who was here with the story of the woman at the well Sunday that was in Samaria that woman in Jerusalem would already have been stoned being five times divorced. So there's levels of legalism and religious tension. And this was the most religious possible. And adultery is like one of the worst. It's always interesting why they didn't bring the guy. So the woman, he was innocent. 
Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> dear Lord. <laughs> Are you married, brother? <laughs> Lord, <laughs> take care of your daughter. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. So religion puts us in the midst. Because what does the law say? The essence of the law is thou shall, shall, or thou shall not. True? Whatever the law says, it all starts with thou shall. Or it's thou shall not. But it puts you in the midst. So why can we not have grace and law? Because law puts you in the midst, while grace puts Jesus in the midst. <laughs> Now let's see what, uh, what, what do you say? We're saying we're side with Moses. And we say, let that lady there who's in the midst, let's stone her. Let's grab some stones. Let's do it. Let's give her what, her, what she deserves. Ah, oh, dirty one. So God, I'm glad I'm different. I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> let's stone her. But what do you say, Jesus? And it was not even with the intention that they want to know what, what should we really do. It was actually to call Jesus. They want to catch Jesus. They actually want to kill Jesus there. That was the idea. Yeah. But Jesus is quite clever. He thinks, hmm, guys. So he's, he's bending down. He's writing a bit on the ground. You know, it's the finger of God who wrote the law. So Jesus is messing with them. So you want to challenge me with the law? Well, I wrote that thing, so I'll be fine. But he thinks, how do I get them out of the way? So he says, okay, let's do any, those of you who are without si sin cast the first stone. And then they all leave. And that gives him some space to tell her with some privacy so that they couldn't stone him for his answer. <laughs> you see, he gets them out of the way. He's the king of the temple. He's the true lamb. He's the god of that temple where he is. So he moves, he makes sure, be gone. <laughs> Out of my way. And then, because imagine if they would have been witnessed what he says to the woman. What that would have done. And he had to walk his journey that he wouldn't be killed before it's time. So he makes sure they're all out of the way. And then we get what grace and truth does for the lady. She gets grace. Those who, who were at the story of the woman at the well, what did the woman at the well receive with her five times uh, marriage and uh, living together with the guy and uh, hating everyone around her? Did she get grace upon grace? Upon grace? Upon grace? Upon grace? Did it make her a sinner? What did it make her? The grace upon grace it made her an evangelist. So Jesus says to this lady, he says, did no one condemn you? So he looks up. She's there. They're left alone in the temple of God, in the house of God. God himself is kneeled down there. He says to her, did no one condemn you? Neither do I condemn you. From God's mouth, I do not condemn you. Listen, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then the people say, yeah, you see, it's grace and truth. The grace is, I do not condemn you. And the truth is, now go and sin no more. So was Jesus putting himself at the center for her? I do not condemn you. You take my place, the place of innocence, the place of righteousness. I'll take your place. And then he, before she walks away, he said, but now we switch the system. You get one time grace. It's not grace upon grace. Now you need to go and sin no more. If you really get the I do not condemn you. When God says I do not condemn you. It doesn't change his mind a day later. I do not condemn you. And that becomes the power to go and sin no more. That's how it works. You cannot say okay we give grace. And now we go back to the law. Don't go and do it again. It's not true. That's why he immediately says after he knew we would interpret it like that. Okay, you get a bit of grace and then we go back to the law. So what does he say afterwards? And you don't get that preached, but that's the key. 
Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He actually says, keep me at the center and follow me because I'm the light. And if you have darkness and you stay close to me, you don't have to fix your darkness. I just am your light. If you have Jesus, you have the light. Do you have darkness in your life? You have the tendency to sin or whatever. Any of you here? Yes? What's the solution? Go and don't do it again. No, the solution is stick with Jesus. Him pouring grace upon grace with you. And you have the light. And that's the light which needed to enter that grave of Lazarus. That light. And for that, the stone needs to be rolled away. That also is for your and my life. So why are we often still struggling, thinking God loves me but? Because there's often still law in our lives. Or the devil tries to push it back and we put us at the center again. While it's Jesus only at the center. Good, eh? That's what I say, eh? Good, eh? <laughs> and this is so tough for us. So when, when, when you preach what I'm preaching now in the time of Jesus, they really want to stone you. Paul was preaching all this stuff. Really like, no guys, it's grace. It's not law. It's also not a mixture for safety. And if there's scribes and scholars or theologians in the room, they are struggling, I tell you, in their mind. Because there's so many scriptures which, says, which seem to imply, yeah, but it's both. But did you already see now that the truth beside the grace doesn't pertain to that you need to come up with truth or walk in the truth to be good enough for God to pour grace. So the law actually says, thou shall, thou shall not, which put you at the center. Grace says, he will, he will not, keeping him at the center. And that's why after the story of the lady with adultery, she says, I'm the light of the world. Don't try to fix darkness by yourself. Don't try to fix your own darkness. Don't try to fix or to stay away from darkness in your own strength. Just stick with me. Then you'll have light. That's the grace upon grace. So whenever I preach this stuff, and it led to, in the Netherlands, finally to people to start to repent. What I wanted, I want to reach my own tribe. These people live in crazy out there. And I didn't manage when i wasn't even legalistic i was very gracious because that's how, how i got to know god but i didn't realize but there's law in the believers around me and of course i also had law because not if you i was grown up with a policeman that's like growing up with a living law <laughs> so there's law in all of us but i didn't have it in my doctrine but we all struggle with us being put in back in the center feeling guilty feeling shame you still sometimes suffer from shame from guilt or from any of that, that means there is to be left a further rolling away the stone of your life. Because for a son or a daughter of God, there is no shame. There is no guilt. Just have the stone rolled away a bit further that more light comes in. And there's nothing required from you. Because you simply cannot. You cannot go from here and thinking, oh, I received a no condemnation from the adultery I once committed and never actually confessed to anyone. But now I know, okay, there's no condemnation for me. And now I need to walk away and go and do no more. Ooh, ooh, better walk away with Jesus. Knowing yourself righteous, walking in him, receiving grace upon grace, even when you get the temptation, thinking, oh, thank you, it's forgiven, it's forgiven, it's forgiven, it's forgiven. That'll keep you from committing adultery. If you go in your own strength, it will not work. So when I'm preaching, when I'm preaching this stuff in these times, there's always someone who says, yes, but Jesus said, I don't come to abolish the law. Was there anyone here? You don't have to stick up your hand. <laughs> Let's read it. Let's read it. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Is it there? Yes, there it is. You see, 
You see, Marcel, you with you. Even Jesus says, I don't come to abolish the law. But let's read on. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. That, you know what that made them angry? Imagine that you walk around as a self-righteous person. I do all God demands from me. I'm keeping the law. I'm, I'm living a holy life. I know my God and God is very pleased with me because I don't sin. Look, I don't commit adultery. I would love to, but I don't do it. <laughs> Imagine that you say to your wife, gents, you say to your wife, I will not commit adultery because God says I shouldn't. Now I'm keeping the law. Ask your wife how appreciative she is of that statement. So God's only way is love. Honey, I, by the grace of God, I will not commit adultery. And I think I'm going to manage because I love you. God made me love you. I really love you. I want to go for you. I want to offer that as a husband to you on behalf of God, that you're completely safe, that you know value, that you're never rejected. And that's what grace works out in the guy. Living by grace. But Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish. You know what the word is in the Greek? I didn't come to separate it, to cut it to pieces, the law. Because that's what they had done. They had taken the Ten Commandments and said, okay, how does this work? Okay, if we do this, this, that, 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 then it works. He says, so uh, you, could, you, could, you could keep the eighth commandment, but break the second in the same action. But they made it all separate. He says, I didn't come to separate the whole thing. What you do, you make it keepable. And I didn't come to help you with that. But at the same time, I came to fulfill while they were thinking, but we're fulfilling it. We are fulfilling it. God is pleasing. I'm doing all that work to live holy. We are fulfilling it. And Jesus says, I came to fulfill. We should conclude, if Jesus came to fulfill, then apparently we cannot. And for the people who struggle with that, James later said in one of his letters, if you break one, you break all. The law is a composite whole. It stands for holiness. So we're still happy with ourselves if we keep one law. Yeah, but God says, if you break one of the other ones, you're doomed. And the punishment is death. Because if you break one, you break all. So you're immediately guilty of the highest crime. And the punishment is death. So if any of you here wants to be righteous through the law, I can already tell you what the end of that is. You will die. <laughs> Because you cannot. So Jesus says, we're not going to water anything down. We're not going to water anything down. You know what? I will fulfill it. You know that the word fulfill is from the same family when Jesus said at the cross, it is finished. It is fulfilled. And what was fulfilled? The keeping of the law because all life he kept the law. And then at the same time, whatever the law requires from mankind... That was fulfilled. And if the requirements are not met, punishment is demanded. And Jesus took all the punishment at the cross. That's where he said, it is fulfilled. It is finished. The fulfillment of the law is finished, including all the requirements, including all punishment, including ultimate sentence, which is death. So the law is fulfilled. But this, he says, at the beginning of the gospel, this is the beginning of the New Testament people. Are you New Testament believers? Yes. You know where your New Testament starts with? Never let your sonship be robbed. <laughs> Don't be tempted by the devil to not feel loved if something goes opposite scripture in your life. Don't try to work for do something God is already well pleased. You know why? Because the law is fulfilled. It's fulfilled. The only thing you need is Jesus. Did you say yes to Jesus? You're done. You're good.
<sighs> Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Well, why is he saying that? Because he says, I fulfill, but then he seems to make it tough again. I tell you, not one thing will be taken off of it. It will be all need to be fulfilled by and for everyone. Ooh, what is he doing? Why, why, why is it? Accomplish this again from the family. Finished. So what he's actually doing is saying to the crowd, you have that choice. Are you going by the law of Moses or will you be going by me? Only going by me, you will require that accomplishment which is needed. And nothing will be taken out for anyone, ever. And they th they're thinking, yeah, but we have it quite together. So it's okay if nothing is taken out. And then the Lord starts to challenge them. We don't realize, but he starts to challenge them. He says, but I tell you, <clears throat> because they are still thinking there we have that covered jesus yeah you say uh you say uh, every every jot and tittle it all needs to be accomplished all need to be fulfilled all need to be kept <clears throat> no one heaven and earth doesn't uh, we're good and the lord knows them this so is he, he thinks really guys if i say the law has to be kept to the ultimate and your conclusion is we have that covered <laughs> He says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Now, don't look at your spouse. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Raka says like, uh, you useless piece of beep. <laughs> You're unworthy. You're useless. And anyone who says, you fool. <coughs> Wives, <laughs> watch it what you say to your husband. <laughs> Will be in danger of the fire of hell. And then a bit further, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. This is Moses. So Jesus starts qu quoting Moses. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully <coughs> has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Guys, what's the punishment for adultery? Death. And now he says, Moses says, don't commit adultery. And you made it keepable, like if we abstain and we don't do it, then we have it covered. Then Jesus says, you know what? If you look at a woman and you think, hmm, done, finished. <laughs> you just have committed adultery. If your right eye causes you to stumble, <coughs> gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to throw into hell. And then it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. If your hand attempts you to sin, better cut it off. You want to accomplish righteousness through the law? That was what that will mean. Because not one jot, not one tittle will be ever taken away from the law. It's impossible. It has to stand for God's holiness. But L Moses was already quite heavy and unkeepable. And what did Jesus do? Because they made it keepable. They abolished it. Jesus says, no, 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 I don't come to abolish it. I actually come to confirm it. And I'll lift it a bit higher for the ones who think they have it covered. Did you ever have any thought about a woman nowadays? You can also say that to the women. Okay, that doesn't land yet. <laughs> if a woman had a thought about the other woman. <clears throat> what was he doing? What was he doing? This is the start of the gospel. He says, you guys are live with the law, but you don't know God. You live with the law, but you don't know God. And you think you're pleasing to God, you're serving God because you think you keep the law. I'll tell you, you are not. You don't know God and you're not keeping his law. And then Paul comes, who was also all the time stoned and beaten by the Jewish, the religious Jewish, I have to say, because Paul was a Jew, who know that salvation comes through the Jews. 
Jesus was a Jew. And it has been Jewish ministers who taught us the gospel. We're in depth of them. And then Paul explains in doctrine what Jesus was doing. If you don't understand Jesus, go to Paul and he will explain what he does. You know what Jesus was doing in Matthew 6? Making, making the law of Moses even more unkeepable. He was doing this. We read in Romans 3, we read this. Say with me, now we know. And I tell you, most of us don't know. You know what I said Sunday? That the, the Lord said to me, that, that the, the Lord said to me, son, you don't know I turn all things for good. The Bible says regularly, now we know. Now we know. And the problem is most of the Christian church hasn't known. So this is again, now we know. Say with me, now we know. Now check if you knew it or not. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So whenever the law speaks, it speaks to the person who are under it. Are you still at the midst of your religious life? Then the law will keep speaking to you. And you can put someone else in the midst thinking, but they're worse sinner. I'm quite good off. <laughs> but actually you're standing in the midst. Whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. It actually says whatever the law says, even how Jesus raised it, it speaks to those who are under it and keep themselves under it and still think that's how we need to please God or get to know God. Then the law keeps speaking until every mouth, this is a very gentle translation, every mouth is silent. It actually says in other translations until every mouth is shut. The law is meant to be to come into your life and you're, you're serving God and you're doing for God. God says, I let it exist until you realize that actually the law is saying to you, shut up. Whew. Oh, that's quite harsh. Yes, because the holiness of God is quite harsh and the sentences to all are. So... Trying to serve God through our doings, thou shall, thou shall not, is actually called dead works. Serving God by having Jesus at the center, his works comes through us out of it. If we receive grace upon grace, actually life comes out. And the whole world held accountable for God. You know what, what, what makes you shut up? What should be the next conclusion after you shut up? Because I could preach to you if I would preach the law to you and keep the law to you. If I wasn't rolling away the stone, but I was doing the opposite. You would all be like, yeah, brother, you're a nice teacher, but this is tr truly impossible what you're all asking here from us. Who the flip can do that? And they said it at one point to Jesus. Who can do that? He says, what's impossible with man is possible with God. <laughs> so he would be the solution. Jesus is our solution. The grace upon grace which pours from Jesus. If you allow Jesus in your life, you know what happens? The thou shall, the thou sh shall not are gone. It's, it's turned into, but now I will and I will not towards you. So the law demands, Pastor Prince always teaches, and grace supplies. The law demands from you, grace supplies to you. So whatever is still required, you turn to Jesus and say, help me. I cannot do this. And then grace flows. And then you know that it wasn't you. Because whatever we accomplish, we're always like, oh, look, I did that well. Oh, you see, wifey, at the end of the year, again, I didn't commit adultery all year. Aren't you proud of me? He thinks I'm proud of you. <laughs> if you would have done it, you would be dead. It's not, the, no, it's not only the law, it's a killing, guys. You have to be. <laughs> so... So the law was given to make every human being on the planet realize, actually, we cannot. And then God can say, no, you need a savior. And you know what? I am your savior. I am your savior. God is our savior. Jesus is our savior. And God did it. He gave Jesus because he's our Abba. He wants his kids in the family without the risk that they ever get lost again.
But you cannot mix law and grace because you will fail. The law will always become dominant. Everyone who's sitting here and say, yeah, but it's actually the law helps me to keep course. You're fooling yourself. You're not living the love life God has for you, but also through you to another. Oh, the human mind and our ego is so clever. We'll find so easy reasons to keep a bit of law involved. Because we can boast. And we say, yeah, but I did that. I'm doing that good. You know that the law actually has its roots in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it says it's a deadly tree. Did you ever meditate on the fact that the knowledge of good is as deadly as the knowledge of evil? <laughs> in the knowledge of good and evil, you have the thou shall and the thou shall not. Thou shall do good, thou shall not do evil. And no one can do it. It's death. Only Jesus can do it. And he did it. And he wants to do it in us and through us. And it's quite a heavy sermon, but it's to liberate you. Remove the law and the legalism from your life. Whatever that takes, whatever that means, that's like a journey. It's still ongoing in, in my life because you come into new seasons. And then life, something is happening. And again, you find yourself challenged. How does this work? How does this life then work with the Lord? And that's okay. That's a lovely journey. Yes. Um, last thing, and then the people, uh, some people need to leave because we would be done at nine. Sorry. Sorry. My, my excuse is I hope you can be gracious to me. <laughs> the fear that we start sinning if we make it all about grace. I'll give you one last verse and then the people who need to go for work. And even if you go now, don't feel ashamed. If you think, man, I have an appointment, dude. Please go. It's, it's good, we understand. And uh, after one verse, and then we have a, a little break. For sin shall not have dominion over you, Paul says in Romans 6. For you are not under law, but under grace. Read this carefully. We're afraid that if it's only grace, that will end up sinning. Yeah, if you tell, tell to the people it's only grace, then we go out and sinning. Like if you come out of the grave, you've just been dead because of sin, and now you come out, and now you'll be sinning. No. It says, sin shall not have dominion over you. Who wants sin not to have dominion over your life? Now, here's the, the recipe. For you are not under law but under grace i tell you if you remain under law you keep you at the center you sin will have dominion over you it's by the simple fact because if you put law and sin on the conscience of a human being you will be sinning if you let grace and the, bl the blood of jesus Remove the consciousness of sin and the demands, thou shall not, thou shall, thou shall not. But it actually leads to, thou shall not sin, thou shall do good, which means not sin, and thou shall not commit sin. Now you put sin on the conscience of a human being. If you walk with sin on your conscience, you will be sinning. If you let grace and the blood remove the consciousness of sin from your conscience... You will quit sinning. God didn't give a system which makes us sin. We need to trust him. We need to trust that grace does the job because God wants to save us from sin. God also wants that sin loses dominion over our life because it's still killing. Under the law, sin is killing. Under grace, sin is killing. But we need to trust God's system. God's ways. Your ways are better. Break down, break the ground of all my religions. Break down the wall of all my traditions. Your way is better. And his way is grace. Amen.